and a little backstory. When I was 19, I lived with my mom in a ranch-style house on a road that backed up to a large field. On the other side was the main highway. About half a mile down from me was a loony farmer, and about a mile on the other side of me was pretty much a crack house. I guess someone used to live there, but it was run down at this point. I will say that the crackheads were pretty quiet. Other than those two houses, we were isolated. At the time, I was working full-time and going to school full-time as well. One of my classes ended at 10.30 p.m. I often wouldn't get home that day of the week until about 11.15ish. I was driving home one night, and I noticed some guy walking down the road. He had a yellow shirt and track pants. I remember his outfit because it was kind of stupid. It wasn't weird to see people walking down my road because of the whole crack house thing, but I instinctively looked over at him when I drove past. He turned and smiled, and then waved, which freaked me the fuck out. So I speed the half mile home and pull into my driveway, weirded out. I made sure all the doors and windows were secure, and then sat on the couch to be a paranoid freak and wait to make sure the dude walked past my house. Except he didn't. There was another guy with him, dressed in darker clothes. They actually walked up my driveway and started playing around with my car, testing the handles and stuff. In my hurry, I forgot to grab my phone from my car, so I was kind of worried that's what they were after, until the guy in yellow started approaching my front door. I'm freaking out, so I go to wake my mom up, She's bleary, and I'm trying to explain the situation when we both hear the doorknob turn very slowly. Good thing it was deadbolted. She got out of bed, walked to the door, and then Yellow Shirt knocked. I perched up on the couch so I could get a good look at him and his friend still in the driveway. And the porch light was on because of the sensor. Yeah? My mom said. You dropped your wallet. I told my mom that I had my wallet. It was in my purse. So she calmly told him that she had her wallet and that it was too late to be knocking on people's doors. I remember perfectly what he said next, even though this was about six years ago. Okay. I'm not a bad guy. Just so you know. We were all pretty still. No one moved. Not even the guy at the door. Not even when the porch light went off. And then he tried the handle again. My mom told me to call the cops so she could get the gun. And I told her I didn't have my phone. So she walked to the kitchen to grab hers from the charger. She handed me the phone and walked to the bathroom. Stared out the window into the backyard. Then she went to her room to grab her Ruger. I was talking to the cops and explaining the situation. All while watching the two guys explaining that there were two suspicious men at our door, when my mom came back out and said, one in our backyard too, which explained why she had looked out the bathroom window. She glimpsed him from the kitchen and went to get a more discreet look. My mom walked back over to the door with her gun and loudly said, if he tries the handle again, I'm going to open the door and shoot him. Fuck knows why she said that instead of waiting for the cops to arrive but the guys took off down the road. I told her, and she rushed to the bathroom, when the guy apparently in the backyard saw his friends running down the road and sprinted off too. And they were going in the direction of the crack house. The cops searched our house and our yard, and went down to the drug house where they found five dudes hanging around. One was the yellow shirt guy, and I'm assuming his friends were with him. They did get arrested, and nothing weird like that ever happened again, but I was on edge for a while. I still make sure the doors are locked at all times every day, even though I live in a much nicer area now. This all happened over the course of a few years. I was around 16 when this first started, 
living at home with my mom in a small town in the UK. I had just gotten a job at a supermarket 15 minutes walk from my house. My mom was a manager there, but we worked different shifts, so I'd often walk to and from work alone. The route I would take back to work took me through a back alley behind our house that separates our housing estate from the main busy road. This back alley then turns into an opening that's surrounded by trees and bushes. Often, as a kid, I would find dirty needles and beer cans littering the ground amongst the trees, where me and my friends would play hide and seek around there. It became so much of a problem at one point that our housing estate rallied together to clean it all up and cut back the overgrowing weeds, nettles, and bush in the hopes our local council would create a safe place for us children to play. It never happened, and over the years, it's now gone back to how it was, despite all the hopes and effort that was put into that neighborhood project. At night, that opening becomes very sinister. There are no lights, and you often feel like something, or more likely someone, is watching you from behind the trees. It was a favorite for drug addicts and drunks, so eventually my mom stopped us playing around there, and would get mad if she ever caught us trying to sneak through the alley. We were kids and curious, and would usually find any opportunity to do exactly what our parents told us not to. But being 16, I was not a kid per se anymore, and it was the quickest route to work. It began with just a feeling. I'd walk through the alley, hand clearing with the sense that someone else was there. I would just put it down to being alone and paranoid. Eventually, after a few weeks of starting my job, I would hear footsteps behind me. Too scared to look, I'd quicken my pace and be out onto the main road before too long, but nobody would ever follow me out, leaving me feeling a little stupid and scolding myself for letting the paranoia play tricks on my mind. That all changed when I actually saw him. I'd finished my shift at 10pm, so it was around quarter past that I got to the alley. I heard the familiar sound of footsteps, but I'd gotten so used to hearing them and seeing nothing that I just ignored it. That was until I heard him cough. I stole a look and noticed a tall, very stocky man directly behind me. It was so dark I couldn't actually see his features, other than the fact that I could tell he was smiling. I hurried my pace, and began to dial my mom's number, but before I knew it, I was clear of the alley and onto my street. I looked behind me one last time, and saw the man head off from the opposite direction. He was wearing old tracksuit bottoms, white scruffy trainers, a jumper, and a white sports cap. When I got home, my mom asked me about the missed call, but I just told her it was an accident and took myself off for a shower in bed. Why didn't I just tell her? I'll never know. Fast forward a few more months. It had become a regular occurrence to see this guy on my way to work and even on my way home. A lot of the time, he would even follow me up to the supermarket. Me being naive, I chalk it up to coincidence. Maybe he was just going to do a bit of shopping. Yeah, it's a bit weird. It always seems to be on the days that I'm working, and at the exact same time I have to be walking to and from work. But it's not as if he's stalking me. Things like that don't happen to girls like me. I eventually started to spot him inside the supermarket, always standing at the ends of the aisles I was working in. He would either pretend he was looking at something on the shelves, or quickly run out of sight. If I was on checkout duty, he would always choose my tail to queue up in, even if others were free and mine was busy. He wouldn't say anything though, just brush my hand when handing over money to pay for whatever stupid shit he would queue up for, a bar of chocolate, or a tin of baked beans, something he could quite easily pay for at self-checkout, where it would be quicker and easier. I had become increasingly uncomfortable with the amount of times I would see him, and started to realize that this odd behavior wasn't just coincidence or me being paranoid. He was definitely stalking me. One particular shift during the day, I had noticed him again. 
and was in the pen aisle stacking tins of dog food. He came over to me and asked if I had a dog. I said I didn't and turned my back to him. He said that he had a Jack Russell and asked if I liked them. I said yes and that I liked all dogs and tried to stand to walk away. He sort of loomed over me and said, Do you want to come on dog walks with me? To which I replied no thank you and then I had to get back to work. I walked off towards the staff door that leads to the back offices. I bumped into the security guard on the way, whom we'll call Alex, and quickly began to explain to him what had just happened. And what he told me literally made my skin crawl. He said he had been following him around for over an hour. It turns out freaky Jack Russell guy had been following me too. Everywhere I went, hiding behind the aisles and people so that I couldn't see him. If I went into the back to get more stock and replenish the shelves, he would wait around near the doors just out of sight, then follow me again. He had even seen him rub his crotch while looking at me. This prompted him to radio the boss to alert him of what was going on, only to look up and see that he had disappeared. That's when he had gone looking for him, but it bumped into me instead. He told me to go into the back, not to worry. He was going to kindly ask him to leave. After my shift, Alex gave me a lift home, which I was hugely thankful for as I was pretty shaken up. A few months later, Alex was sacked for stealing some chicken for his dinner. In his defense, a lot of the staff did it. They'd pick up something from the ready-to-eat counter like a sandwich or some chicken wings and take them straight into the back. He was just the only one that got caught. And because of this, they hired a new security guard. And almost instantly, I began to see freaky Jack Russell guy back in the store. Alex being the only one apart from me remembering his face. It's like he felt it was safe to come back to the store. Only this time, he brought his wife and children with him. Every time. Me being me, too soft for my own good, left him to it. And didn't tell anyone about him being back. He would still choose my tool to go through would make a big show of kissing his wife and children. I just ignored him and tried to get the transaction over as soon as I possibly could, and he would often still turn up in the aisles I was working in, but always have at least one of his children with him, so I couldn't say anything. Now at this point, it had been close to two years that this had all been going on. I was suffering health issues, so I had to take a lot of time off of work. I spent a few weeks in the hospital, and then a further 12 weeks recovering at home, and then I was eased back into work with a couple shifts per week only 4 hours long. It was after one of these shifts at around 10.15pm that I happened to be walking through the clearing again. I was about halfway through when I felt a tap on my shoulder. I swear I nearly jumped out of my skin, did a sort of yelp, and span around to see freaky Jack Russell guy standing directly behind me, holding a rose. He told me he'd missed me and said he was glad I was better, which I didn't know how he knew. He commented on the fact that I'd lost weight and said he preferred a bit of meat on his women, but that it was okay because he was a good cook and could soon fatten me up. He then said that he was disappointed that I'd gotten new blinds on my bedroom window because it made it harder for him to see me. At this point, I'd had enough of this guy's bullshit and said in no uncertain terms to leave me the fuck alone. Well, the next time I saw his wife, I would tell her everything. And then I'd be paying a little visit to the police station if I ever saw his ugly face again. And then I ran. I ran all the way home and locked every door and window behind me. I sat up all night that night, terrified to see him outside my bedroom window. But you know what? It worked. I didn't see him again. I quit my job at the supermarket and bought a car so I wouldn't have to walk down any creepy alleys ever again. Now I'm 26, so it's been a long time since those days. I was at my sister's house having a catch-up and playing with my nieces when she starts to tell me about this guy that had been brought into her work. My sister works in a prison and usually spends her shifts signing new prisoners in and allocating them to their cells. This is an important job because you don't want to put a murderer in with a pedophile. Scratch that. You do want to do that, 
but it would cost her her job, so you basically can't. Anyway, this guy that had been brought in was in for stalking, assault with a deadly weapon, and rape. She said she recognized him instantly, as when she used to work at the same supermarket's patrol station that I worked at, he had followed her home on more than one occasion, until she finally moved out and never saw him again. My sister is nine years older than me. She said that she had read the details of the case after allocating him to his cell, and had gotten his full name to search a photo of him on Facebook to show me. It was him. Freaky Jack Russell guy. He had been following this 17-year-old girl for a while, and she had reported it to the police, but they did nothing. And this girl had seen him outside her house, and on her way to and from work. She worked at a different supermarket than I did, half an hour from my house. After a particularly late shift, the girl was walking around the back of the store towards the bus stop, when somebody grabbed her from behind. He held a knife to her throat, and raped her there on the wet, cold concrete right near a main road but just out of sight so no one could see. After he finished, he kissed her, told her he loved her, and tossed a rose at her feet before leaving towards the bus stop. The girl watched him sit patiently at the bus stop and actually wait for his bus as if he'd done nothing wrong. Then after he got on the bus, he waved goodbye to her. That guy is another kind of messed up. She rang her mom, who rang the police. They caught him through CCTV images and DNA, and now he's locked up for six years. The thing is, could I have stopped that from happening if I just rang the police and told them what was happening to me? Would they have arrested him sooner? Would it have discouraged him from taking it that step further and actually hurting someone? I do blame myself sometimes. I know that guy is a monster, and I can't help but wonder if he ever touched them kids of his... After all, I wouldn't put it past someone who's as deluded as that guy. But I can't help but be so grateful that it didn't happen to me. He did have a rose that night he spoke to me in the alley. I wonder what he was planning on doing to me. The following story occurred in June of 2017. For some context... I live in a fairly major city bordering a great lake, and I live pretty much right on the coast, about three or so blocks inland off the lake. I live in a small one-bedroom apartment with my girlfriend of five years, Julia, and our two goofy-ass cats. We both work full-time. She makes chocolate, and for now, I'm driving delivery. We spend our idle hours playing video games together and making snacks in our cozy little window on the skyline. Neither of us earns much, but we do well enough to get by most of the time, and take each other on the occasional night out for drinks, dinner, movies, or all of the above. About two weeks before this story's events occurred, I had just lost a relatively high-paying job as a writer in a suburb of town. It was my first real job out of college. Anyway, on my first few days with no work to go to, I made a habit out of driving down to a nice spot on the lake. It was just a circular parking spot, nothing special, but it brought you close enough to the lake where you could see it without getting out of the car. It was just a tranquil place to hang out and spend some time. That day, I had gone there specifically to look at the lake and watch the James Comey hearings on my phone, while I occasionally switching to the Indeed app to send in some resumes. After I had been there for about an hour, I decided it was probably time to head home. As I backed out of the circular lot, I felt the sudden, irresistible urge to look behind me. When I did, I saw a light blue, late model Hyundai pull in, and the driver was staring intensely at me. I looked away, assuming it was just an awkward moment, as these things usually are. When I looked again, he was still looking at me. I exited the parking lot, thinking he'd only just pulled in, and thus was unlikely to immediately leave. I glanced into my rearview mirror as I drove away from the parking lot, and just as I was about to turn a corner, I saw that light blue Hyundai pull out and follow my direction. Again, I brushed it off. Certainly, it must be a coincidence. Maybe he got to the lot and there were too many people there for his liking. 
What do I know, right? I decided that just to be safe, I would take a few odd turns on my way home to ensure he isn't following me. There are two main roads in my town that are parallel to one another, with small residential streets bracing them. I took a path on these main roads and down side streets that nobody could have simply mimicked by chance. But after every turn, I would look back and he'd be there. When I turn, look into the rear view. There he is. Left turn, take a look. He's there again. My heart flutters a little bit, but I start to realize something might actually be going on here. No, I'm not a big guy. 5'11", 165 pounds, soaking wet. I'm not a pushover, and I'd be prepared to defend myself, but I'd be lying if I said I wouldn't avoid that outcome at all costs if I could help it. Bravado is a stupid reason to get yourself killed. After he had followed me for far too long, I was totally fed up and decided to do something decisive to determine what the fuck was happening. I decided to pull into a gas station and up to a pump with a clear path in front of me. That way, he would have to follow me in there or fuck off. I was hoping for the latter option, but I had none such luck. I pulled up to the pump, leaving my car in drive just in case I had to peel out of there. He pulls in behind me and up to the adjacent pump. His windows were so tinted I couldn't see inside. He'd had them down at the parking lot when I saw him staring. I begrudgingly lowered my window, and he did the same, revealing his old, sunken face. He couldn't have been too much older than 50 or 55, but this guy's face was all sorts of fucked up. I felt a primal, negative reaction to him immediately. It was powerful, and it stifled me. Seconds later, I managed to find my voice. Can I help you with something? I have shouted. You think I didn't notice you following me? What do you want? His face grows angry and red before he simply says, No, you're not her. He speeds away, tires screeching. At this point, I'm more confused than before. I'm angrier than before. I decided to call the police and report the incident. The dispatcher directed me to the park authorities. The officer asked if I would be willing to meet him down at the parking lot where the incident began to give a brief statement. I drove directly there with new confidence. Even if the prick followed me back here, the cops are meeting me there. Problem solved, I thought to myself. I pulled into the parking lot and picked a spot in direct line of sight at the entrance so that the officer could easily spot me when he arrived. I was flipping through my phone to kill them idle time. Well, I waited for the officer, when I glanced up from my phone, and wouldn't you know it, the same light blue Hyundai was pulling into the lot. I couldn't believe it. Still, I remained unafraid. I did a circle around the lot and exited directly. It was as if he was just sweeping the area. Maybe he was looking for someone. Finally, the officer showed up a few minutes later. I gave him the rundown of what had happened and then told him he had just been in the lot. Thirty seconds later, the motherfucker pulls in again. I point the car out to the officer, and impulsively shouted, That's him! Before I remembered who I was talking to. The officer gave me a look of surprise and flagged the car down, and directed it to pull into a parking lot spot to turn the car off. He spent about ten minutes talking to the man. When he walked back over, he informed me that the man had said I was doing something creepy, and he wanted to make sure I wasn't going to hurt anybody. I had to admit to chuckling a little bit at the accusation. The officer reassured me though. They knew of this guy, but he didn't say what for. All he said was that the man was shaking and asking to apologize by the time the officer escorted him home. The man was told he was not welcome back in the park due to his past behavior, and is following me all over town. I felt that justice was applied and drove home happily, albeit indirectly. That night, my girlfriend and I were sitting on our third story balcony smoking cigarettes and sipping on beers around 2am. We were just talking and enjoying being home together, with no chores or obligations on our backs. The stress of unemployment was momentarily dulled to a whisper in the back of my mind, but then we saw it. The light blue Hyundai, 
or at least what I thought it was, idling on the street. It was two houses down from our apartment building, and we were certainly visible. Of course, I had already told Julia about what happened that day in detail, so when I put my finger to my lips and suddenly gestured toward the idling car in the street, she understood what was happening. I think that's the same car, I said. It was too dark to make out the exact color. The shade of light blue could have easily been confused with white at the nighttime. I had written his license plate number in the notes in my phone and squinted to try and make the plate out from a distance. I could tell that the first two digits and the last matched, and that was enough for me. I called the police and explained the situation. As I'm talking to the dispatcher, the car slowly pulls away. The dispatcher tells me there are officers nearby, and they'll come inspect the area. I tell him that the car pulled off, but she reassured me that there were units nearby and they would look for him. They never found the car, and I triple-checked my locks that night. After a few weeks had passed, Julia and I had all but forgotten about that odd and somewhat scary encounter. We both had a sweet tooth late one night and decided to just hit the gas station on the corner for some crappy snacks and Gatorade. I needed gas anyway. Julia drove to the station and I went into the store to get the goodies. As I was walking out of the store toward Julia in the car, I look over and that ugly blue Hyundai has pulled up and that man is staring Julia down. I stared directly at him, and he meets my gaze. I just stared and stared. I wanted him to know I saw him. I get to the car quickly and corral Julia inside. I lock the doors and explain what's going on. We're both pretty freaked out at this point, but doing our best to stay composed. We pull out and drive randomly under the assumption we're being followed. We dial the cops again and they send more cars out to look. Nothing came of it, and we haven't seen the guy since. The only information we learned was that the park rangers knew him because he had been caught following women around trails of the park, particularly women with headphones on who were walking or jogging alone, something my girlfriend likes to do. His debacle with me was the last straw, and that's why he was banned from the park. My impression is that he saw Julia driving my car around town, as she often does, and saw what he liked. Having associated her with my car, it would explain why he followed me, hoping it was her. It's impossible to be sure, I guess. The police told us they would keep us posted if anything came of it, but just told us to call if we see him near us again. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here as always. I just wanted to thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. Uh, if you guys like the video, please feel free to leave a like, comment, or subscribe if you feel so inclined. Uh, if you have any feedback or suggestions for stories you'd like to see, or anything like that, be sure to leave a comment below, because I always read all of the comments. Uh, I have a pretty big update for the channel for you guys. So, as you guys probably know, things have been pretty rough lately for the YouTube horror narrator community. Uh, basically, on YouTube, a bunch of advertisers pulled out and now everybody is getting uh, way less returns on their views and everything like that. So, I wanted to announce that I finally set up a Patreon account where you guys can donate and contribute to the channel. Uh, if you like, of course, it's never necessary. Uh, none of my content will remain necessary to be paid for or anything like that. Basically, what Patreon is, is it's just a tip jar for uh, artists, if you feel like supporting them. Uh, of course, if you don't have the money or anything like that, please don't feel like you have to or anything. Uh, it's just there for people who want to. So I'll be leaving a link to that uh, in the description of the video and also probably in a comment with the timestamps for stories for this video. Uh, please give me feedback on what you guys think about that. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous about it, but I hope it will go over well. Uh, and I hope you guys understand why I'm doing that. 
If you'd like to contact me, or if you have any stories you'd like to send in or that you'd like me to read, please be sure to take a look in the description of the video below. There will be links to all of my social media, including my Facebook, Twitter, and Gmail accounts. Send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the header of the email, or whatever you choose to send, what the title of the story is, uh, what the theme of the story is, if it has any, and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. If you're curious about the music used at all in this video, the music is always in the description below, in the order which it appears in the video, and I also leave links to the artists themselves in case you like their music and would like to give them support and check out more of their work. And of course, if you have any constructive criticism, please be sure to leave it in the comments below, as I'm always looking for new ways to improve the channel. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.